but you can see we weren't content to leave the snow outside. We had to bring it in here. So I just, it just dawned on me as I'm standing here worshiping that we have snow in here now. So but I guess that's part of uh, getting ready for Christmas and celebrating that way. And so great to have you with us. So if you're visiting or you're new or maybe you've just jumped in recently, we are walking through um, the good news of Jesus Christ according to the Apostle Matthew. We ought to be disciplined in how we say that a bit, the Gospel of Matthew. But it's really the good news, the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew, who was one of the twelve, who brings a beautiful flavor to his presentation, who the, those that assembled after the Scripture was affirmed and taken and believed to be the Word of God as they assembled the new covenant, pieced it together in the order that we find it. Matthew comes first for good reason. And they place it there because Matthew of all authors shows the fulfillment of the old. Of all the authors in Scripture, of at least of the four for sure of the gospel writers, Matthew's point is to show you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of David. He's the King, and He fulfills what the Jewish nation, what Judaism has been waiting for. It's Him. He's the one. And you'll sense this and you'll feel it. So we're walking through Matthew, and I always want to keep dragging you back to the context. That's part of the beauty of studying Scripture. Yes, you can grab what we're going to take today and, and just hold on to it as its own little single standalone unit. But if you feel it in the context of, of Matthew, you'll, you'll see something maybe you haven't seen before, and you might sense and feel something. I told you that one of the reasons why I wanted to bring us, the church, into one of the Gospels in this time during our lives in the state of the church as we see it now is because I wanted you to see Jesus again. I wanted you to see Him. I wanted you to hear Him. I wanted you to feel Him. I wanted, I wanted you to see Him again. I think we lose Him in the midst of our culture. We, we, we tend to morph and create a Christianity, whether it's the one we see in the mirror, the one that we, we see in the, in the midst of the church. We, too much of the world bleeds into it, and we lose Him. We don't, he doesn't, it's like we don't look like He looked anymore. So go back to the Gospels regularly and look at Him, see Him, watch Him. We'll see him today as he begins to have his first teaching, his, his blessings. I call this the king's blessing today. And I, and I would challenge you. I mean, I, I challenge you who have yet to give your life to Christ. You're, I, I know I sat in church for a while, and I, I walked through this, and I think, okay, is this the same stuff? Is it different stuff? And watch him. I ought to be able, we ought to be able to say, look at us, and that ought to be enough, but it never is. So now I want to say, look at him, and if you will, you will find no one like him. These words that we're about to launch into, Matthew 5 through 7, which you heard in its beautiful entirety, I mean, in the whole feel of it last week. These words are so different than anything you've ever heard. I promise you. Pay attention and watch and listen and see him and hear him and then make up your mind, but do it quickly. And those of you who are followers, us, we follow him. Look at him again. Stare at him. Hear his words again. And ask yourself a very serious question as we walk through his words. Matthew's famous for these long discourses. We're about to launch into one that's going to take months and months to get through. Maybe a year. No, months. <laughs> Just this first one, the Sermon on the Mount. Watch and hear him and see him, and then go stare in a mirror and ask yourself if that's what you see. Is that me? Because the point of the Word of God as He does His work in you, Christian, is to transform you into His Son. 
It is a transformation process to where you're more and more like him. So I would challenge you, encourage you to stare anew and ask yourself the deep questions, particularly in this part of the text. Is this me? Is this you? He's describing something very different here. So join me in Matthew chapter 5. We, we heard this last week. Thank you, Scott, who, who gave this to us. We, we wanted you to hear it like, like you might have heard it just listening to it. Like the first folks who heard it some 2,000 years ago would have heard it just, just like that. And Pastor Brett did such a nice job on setting the scene after Pastor Walt kind of set the stage of him calling his team together. We see him, now a handful of his disciples come together and, and he, he selects his team. We see at least four of them. And they're with him and in these moments and then he moves into a teaching moment. And the st- the stage is set in, at the end of chapter 4. It's that crowd that gathers there, beginning in 23, where Jesus is, is ministering in Galilee, right? In the northern area, if you will, up by the Sea of Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles. These are not the blue bloods. That was Jerusalem. That was south. And he's teaching them, and they assemble, and they're all coming after him. And they're messed up, broken people, the afflicted. At the end of 4, right, his fame spread, verse 24, his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the blue blood theologians. No. They brought him the sick and those afflicted with diseases, and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures, and he brought them the paralytics, and he was healing them. So you got to picture this crowd around him now. It's a very specific crowd, and he's healing them. Jesus' miracles were always a demonstration of his words. They weren't to show off power. They were a physical, literal demonstration of what he was saying, who he was who he is. He's the healer. He's the Christ. He's the, he's the Lord. He's, he's God. And this text that we run into here in chapter 5 is called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, now many of us have heard this before. You've, you've heard a, a phrase, the Sermon on the Mount, right? You've, I think most of us have heard that phrase, that term before. It's probably more popular than actually knowing what it is. I remember watching a survey many years ago. Have you ever heard of the Sermon on the Mount? And most people say, yeah, I've heard of that. Who gave it? I don't know. Billy Graham. I don't know. But this is a sermon. Matthew presents it in such a way, and there's a debate here as to whether chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, is issued in one fell swoop. Did he actually sit down in a place and begin to teach his disciples? And here we go. Takes about 17 minutes to just read it through at a nice pace. Others think Matthew kind of compiled it as his mean teachings at the front end of his ministry. I like to think, because of the way he presents it here, Matthew, that it feels like one, it feels like a piece to me. It feels like one setting. I love it as one piece, so, so it's a shame we rip it apart, and it, it, it's nice to hear the, 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 the chunks of it. The Sermon on the Mount, I want to say, makes being good, it makes goodness attractive. Pay attention to him. It, 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 makes, it makes his description of who we ought to be, who we are in him, beautiful. At the same time, it's so incredibly different from who we are. It, it almost shames us when we think about, I want to be like this and I'm not. It, it, it's a standard that's beautiful. He's presenting here something that he calls us to and describes us to in the context of the kingdom. I mean, it embodies a beauty that's better than what we see even in the midst of ourselves, in the midst of the church. I want to say I wish, I wish I saw this more in the mirror. I wish I saw this more in the church. 
It's the constant contrast of being different in Christ. It is the call of a king describing the kingdom to the citizens of the kingdom. That's what I want you to think as we move through this. This is the call of a king who's describing the kingdom to the citizens of the kingdom. And, he's, and he creates and shows this movement and pattern of behavior. Bring your mind into where Matthew places this. He's the Christ. He's the fulfillment that was promised to Abraham. He's the king. He's the son of David. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. The forerunner has already shown up and said, John, his recorded words, repent for the kingdom of heaven. It's here at hand, right here. Grab it. And the very first words, public words, that Jesus is recorded saying, it's the same thing. Repent, turn, change your mind. For the kingdom of heaven is right here, right now, at hand. That's the setting here. That's, I think, what he's going to describe. It is a covenant that was designed to be written on a heart, not written on stone. It is the contrast and the fulfillment of the old. Because he said that. I gave Jeremiah 31. I gave, I gave you a covenant. A new covenant is coming. This one not written on stone. This one will be written on your heart. What you're about to read here is a covenant with God that he wants written on your heart. That was always the intent for the old, but we rarely achieved it. Right? These commandments are to be upon your heart, Deuteronomy 6. But we rarely achieved it. Well, here he will give it. He will launch into it. This is the law of Christ. Now, Matthew, you cannot escape this. If you're paying attention to Matthew, he is presenting to you the fulfillment of Moses. Remember, it's Hebrew feel. It's Jewish feel. This is the son of David. And when Jesus shows up here, he makes, Matthew gives us some beautiful parallels to show you he is the fulfillment of the old covenant. Factor this through, chapter 2, out of Egypt I call my son. Through the waters, you know the exodus? Through the waters into the wilderness to the mountain where the law is given. Jesus, Matthew 2, out of Egypt. I call my son. He's baptized through the waters. He goes immediately into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And the next thing Matthew shows you is him at a mountain giving his law. It is a beautiful parallel from the old covenant to the new. And when the old covenant was given, if you were to look, Exodus 19, there at the foot of the mountain, on the morning of the third day, Moses writes, that there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp, they trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. And God spoke all these words, saying, and then you get the Ten Commandments. Matthew 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. There's no mountain there, not really. It's a mount. But you should make the parallel in your mind. He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying... This is the new covenant. This is the commandment of the law of Christ written on the hearts of men and women. And he starts with the blessings. We call these the Beatitudes. And I will zoom through them. Zoom. Each of them should cause you to sit for a long time and examine them. There are eight beatitudes here. That's Latin for blessing. What, what's a beatitude? That doesn't even sound right. Blessing. We just love the Latin. Eight blessings. 
And they're not to be picked apart. They're like the, the Decalogue. They're like the Ten Commandments. You don't say, well, I'm going to be and do number one and number two, but I'm going to let go of number seven and eight. <laughs> they're meant to be taken in whole. Um, it, it's shown even in the text, the blessing of the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is the exact same blessing as the last one. Blessed and then and then the reward, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It sandwiches those together so that you don't read them and attempt to somehow separate them. This is all of us. This is all of you for all of these. And the sandwich, number one and number eight, are given in the present tense. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the middle six future. They shall be. Theirs shall be. All of this now spills into the blessing of the king. Present tense now because the kingdom is within us. Future tense because there is a kingdom coming that we will be part of. The other thing that you ought to hold in tension here as you read these things and be challenged by them is whether or not Jesus is just describing people as they are or he's telling you to be like this. Are these predominantly descriptive? I'm describing someone who is poor in spirit. Or am I telling you be poor in spirit? That's a good tension. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Because if you aspire and you seek and you chase and you aim, then you will be. Yes. These are spiritual blessings, not physical. He's not describing material here. He's not describing physical or material or things that we... These are spiritual blessings that he begins the the so-called Sermon on the Mount with. And so, so he begins, right? He sits on the mountain. His own are gathered before him, and he begins to teach them, right? And he, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them. Now, you got a picture. He's speaking to his own and the crowd at the same time. Is he teaching his own, or is he teaching the masses? Yes. Yes. There's a moment at the close of these where he, uh, you can almost feel his head tilt down and stare at his own. He changes it from third person to second first. Yours, you, as opposed to theirs. Now feel these. And I told you, if you've yet to decide on Jesus, pay attention. And I told you, if you are already following Christ, pay attention. <laughs> This is, this is him. This is his blessing here. And here are the beatitudes, the blessings of kingdom living, kingdom life. Number one, verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Each of these descriptors comes with a blessing, and I say it's all in all. It's not like, well, I want to be this guy because I want the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Or I want to be that guy because I want to inherit the earth. Or I want to be this guy because I want to see the face of God. All these are for all of us. Now some of these first ones break down just like the Decalogue, our relationship to God, and then the latter four, our relationship to mankind. Our relationship to God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what in the world is that? These first couple seem the most challenging or at least the least straightforward. Why would he say this first? Why is, if I take this as a spiritual blessing, what does this mean for me? Does that just mean those, you know, blessed are those who are, they're kind of depressed? They're having a bad day or a bad week or a bad year? Poor in spirit. I'm, I'm poor in spirit. Are they having a bad life? Blessed are you if you're just a mess. No. No, these are spiritual. What's going on on the inside of you? How is, what does a person in Scripture look like who's described as being poor in spirit? 
Look at the old covenant and watch here, and I'll put many verses to reinforce these. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, Isaiah 57, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and the holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and a low spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. That's this person here. Almost certainly this is what he means. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are empty, those who are destitute, if you will. Think of poverty. Think of emptiness. Think of, and you come to God, and you will be blessed if you're what? Empty. You ought to picture a cup in your hand. If the cup is full, you can put nothing in it. If the cup is empty, it's ready to be filled. You cannot come to God with a full cup. You've got to get rid of you and have him fill you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They'll be filled. You come empty before God. Uh, and this is so appropriate that this is the first one. That when, and God fills it, then what? Yours is the kingdom of heaven, present tense. Just like that, in, in a real sense. Remember this passage out of Luke, Jesus' is teaching, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. He answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, or literally in the Greek, within you, inside of you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for when you come empty the God, he fills you, and yours is the kingdom of heaven. You have a righteousness that is not your own. Ditch your own. Throw it away. The contrast through this whole sermon is oftentimes against those who had a righteousness of their own. They were never poor in spirit. Paul's words ought to echo in Philippians chapter 3. I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. When Christ calls you, he fills you, he gives you himself, his spirit, and you now have the righteousness of God and the kingdom of heaven is within you. And it comes here right now, right inside, just like that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is another one that would challenge you in the sense of what does he mean? How is mourning a spiritual blessing? How is it that being sad or weeping or somehow being, if you will, emotionally broken, a blessing? Blessed are those who mourn. He's not just talking about being sad. Listen, there is no spiritual virtue in sadness. <laughs> Look at that poor sap. She's moaning. Look at that poor guy. He's just, he's just a mourner. <laughs> Well, that, that, there's nothing great about that. I mean, in the context of heaven and hell, those who are thrown into hell are described as those who weep constantly. It's not a spiritual blessing in and of itself. Remember Jesus' words, which we will see where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, tears and anger. Tears and anger. There's nothing spiritually beautiful about crying unless you're crying for the right reason. Where does the blessing come in the context of mourning? So what's the basis of the mourning? Well, that's clear in Scripture, actually, from a spiritual standpoint. What saddens you? Make your face shine upon your servant, the psalmist writes, 119, 135. And teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. What makes you sad? What makes you broken? What, what, what do you weep over in the sense of a spiritual blessing? 
that God's ways, God's commandments, God's beautiful goodness is not done either in you or on this earth that ought to make you sad. We have a terrible thing that has happened in in evangelical Christianity. I feel like our culture has moved to being angry with the world. I'm not sure if it's the alignment that we've taken with political forces because the one side is always angry at the other. And when the church finds herself aligned with a way of the world, you adopt that anger from one side to the other. Don't go there. When God's Word, when moral decay is ever-present, it is not anger that ought to consume your heart. It is sadness. Weep. I mean, how many of us, we watch and we see our world kind of cut the wheels coming off and we think, oh my goodness, look at this. We can't even figure out what a boy and a girl is anymore. And the next thing you do is clench your fist. And God would say the next thing you ought to do is weep. You ought to cry. It ought to make you sad. Blessed are those who mourn. I love the context of this and in all the ways through Scripture. It is God who mourns first because of mankind's depravity. Genesis 6. This is the most condemning, thoroughly, comprehensively condemning state and statement of the world. And watch what God does. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It doesn't get any more comprehensive than that. That's bad. That's moral decay. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart. That's the first one who weeps over sin, God. Yes, there was discipline. Yes, indeed, there's punishment. But if you don't miss the sadness, you're going to miss the heart of God. Blessed are those who mourn, right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Because I'll make this statement very clearly. It's hard to save a world when you're mad at it. It's hard to save a person when you're angry with them. I mean, for God so loved, for God so hated the way the world behaved, he sent his son. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son. You guys quit shaking your fist and start weeping. It's easy to save someone that you cry over. Or it's a lot easier than if you shake your fist over them. Let's put it that way. Blessed are those who mourn, right? Mourning. Not not for any reason, not for the sake of sadness, but, but for the calling of God on your life. James is the one that tells us to look in the mirror. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up. There's a call to look in the mirror and be sad when you don't. Like, what happened to me? What happened? I want to be like God this way. You should be like God this way. You will be comforted. Meaning what? You want to see the will and the beauty and the, the structure of God done, you will. You will be comforted. You will see it through. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Ponder long and hard about this one. We don't use that word anymore, meek. In fact, I, I wish the translators would have been consistent in bringing the word into the English. This is the word gentle. Gentle. That's what this word means. It's the same word that Jesus uses in in later Matthew would record, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble, low of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Blessed are the gentle. Now ponder that one through. God, are you telling me that I'm blessed if I am? Are you telling me to be so? 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Take no pleasure in someone describing you as a rough, unkind, coarse individual. But, you know, he follows Jesus. Look at him carefully. Blessed are the gentle, <laughs> for they shall inherit the earth. See, it's the opposite of worldly leaders who conquer the earth. They are noted as not being gentle at all. And we've taken the policies and the principles and the rituals and the character of leaders in our world and we've brought them into the church and the church blessings are just the opposite. When was the last time the top-end CEO that you know was described as a gentle person? Not often. And yet, here's the blessing in God. And what is, what's the blessing? The earth will be theirs right? Our world lays claim to such things because they're not gentle. The gentle will receive such things because they are. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is the last of the first four as if I was trying to say, I think the flow is these to God, gentle, meek before God, laying claim to nothing, empty before God, poor that way inside, mourning before God, wanting His, His Word to be done. And now, now blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We know. Isn't that your ritual on Sunday morning? You come here, yeah, like you're, you're famished all day. Maybe you have a coffee. Maybe you have a, a soda. Maybe you have blah, blah, blah. And the first thing you do when you get home, if you're Italian anyway, <laughs> where are we going for lunch? Hunger. It's a state of want. It's a state of something that pulls to be satisfied. I hunger, I thirst, I want what? Righteousness. I'm desperate for it. You, you read the Word of God? Why? I, I want this. I hunger for it. You want God? Yes, I want Him. The psalmist, Psalm 42, maybe a favorite as a deer pants for flowing streams of water, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? There's a thirst and a hunger that Christ says, get it. Ask. We want to pray to God. Pray, ask him, dear God, make me hungry for you. Make me hungry for your ways. Make me thirsty for them because I feel like I, I don't have that pull in me anymore. And if Christ is in you, he'll help. He'll pull you. He'll give you a hunger and a thirst. Want it, pull towards it. He'll give it to you. You will be satisfied. They shall be. And now I think a shift. How are you before men? How are you when you treat the, your neighbor? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Is that how someone describes you? The, the blessing of being a merciful person? Or are you known on the block in your workplace as one that you cross me, I will come after you. <laughs> I'll get it out of you. You cross me, there's no mercy. You know, when God appears to Moses, Exodus chapter 32, the golden calves, the mess of Israel, Exodus 33, and Moses is clamoring, and he's asking God to show him his glory, and God says, a bit, because <laughs> if I showed you it all, you'd turn into a piece of toast. And he says, I'm going to put you up here in the clevis, of, and I'm going to say my name in front of you. And watch what he says. The Lord passed before Moses, and he proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God, we get mercy from God. He's merciful. 
Christ's words, Sermon on the Plain, a very similar context is, is here in Matthew. Be merciful, Jesus says. Why? Because your Father's merciful. If He weren't, we would all be destined to hell because God would simply say, I will give you what you deserve. All of us. But God is a God of mercy and a, a God of grace that way. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, this is the one I used to look at and think, well, I want that. I'm throwing out thirsting for righteousness. I want to see God. You should think long and hard as to whether or not your friends, your co-workers, your classmates, your, the people that you play with on the team, the other coaches that you work with, the folks you hang out with, whether they would describe you as someone who's pure in heart. There is a sense with this word that I, I, draws me to the term integrity, purity. There's nothing hidden. You are who you say you are, and who you are on the inside is who you are on the outside. I like nothing worse, I think, when I'm meeting with someone or talking with someone, and I walk away and I think, she's got an agenda. He's got an agenda. I never quite know where he stands. I hear his words, but I'm not certain. Man, are you a person of integrity? pure in heart. There's nothing messed up there in the context of what's going on. You will see, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It's the only time this word occurs in the entire Bible, peacemaker. You thought that was a very common word. The two words that make it up are very common, peace and maker. Blessed are the peacemakers, those who make peace. And peace is more than a cessation of hostility. Peace is wholeness. Those who bring wholeness into a relationship, those who do it, who make it, who heal it. Not just don't hit me, that's not peace. Make me whole, that's peace. Blessed are the peacemakers because that's how God is. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. What is that? Peace with God. Listen, this is an instrument of peace. Peace. Wholeness. Rescue. When he cries out, it is finished. There's peace. Not just a cessation of hostility between God and us, but a wholeness of righteousness when we believe in him. Peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, <laughs> for they shall be called sons of God. Is that the title you go by? <laughs> John, <laughs> see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God? And so we are. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Last one, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Same blessing. See, it all circles back on itself. And now... It's the blessing of being persecuted, but not for the sake of you deserve a swift kick. I mean, what? If you deserve a swift kick and you get a swift kick, so be it. Where's the blessing? Blessed are those who are persecuted. The Greek means literally to be pursued, chased down for righteousness. 
Blessed are you when others revile you. He expands. When you're reviled, when, the, when you're persecuted, and, and people utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. See, where's the persecution come from? From the fact that I have, I have stood on God's word. I have been like God. And then persecution. Hey, here's this beautiful verse on this issue. Uh, Second Peter or Second Timothy three, indeed Paul writes to Timothy as he's about ready to lose his life. Second Timothy is his last letter. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Is that in your famous Bible promises verse? <laughs> I have, do you have a, a book of God's promises to me? Here you go. All those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I promise. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. <laughs> when was the last time you were reviled or spoken ill of or chased away because you stood humbly and gently for righteousness? Hmm. I can tell you when the last time it was I got a kick in the pants. But when was the last time it was because you're godly? Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Christian, is this who you see in the mirror? Is this who you want to see? And it makes goodness and the beauty of Christ look spectacular. You who do not know Christ yet, do you want this? The kingdom of heaven now and blessings beyond your comprehension in the future. There's, there's the king. These are the rules of the kingdom, the law written on the heart of mankind. Amen? Amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.